Welcome to the reading of In His Presence by E. W. Kenyon. First words. This book is not written about what others were and did, but about what we are and can do. It is a revelation of what we are in Christ, an unveiling of what He can do through us. It is a lifting of the curtain and a revealing of the Holy of Holies and our ability to enter it and stand in the presence of the Father. It is a revelation of our ability to stand in His presence on the behalf of others. It is a discovery of God's ability available to anyone in Christ, an introduction to ourselves in Christ. Much of it will be new and a challenge to earnest spirits, to climb the heights and to sound the depths of these tremendous spiritual realities. It will enable us to know Him and the power and the ability that was revealed in His resurrection, and the amazing fact that that ability is ours. It will show us our legal rights in Christ, that we do not stand upon His sufferance or His pity, but upon our legal rights, claiming them for our very own. It will remove the mist that has surrounded the prayer life, and lead us out of spiritual mysticism into the light of life. It will show us the authority of the name of Jesus and how to use it. It will show us the ability of the indwelling one in us. It will reveal our place in the family, and show us how to take that place. This is not a book of philosophy or of theories, but it is a book of reality. It shows us what belongs to us, and our ability to enjoy all these rights in Christ. Chapter the First What Prayer Is the call to prayer is the Father's invitation to visit with Him. This is more than the consciousness of a great need that often drives us to intercession. It is the call of love to come and fellowship. It is really visiting with the Father. Few of us have realized the fact that the Father's heart is hungry for the companionship of His children. His heart hunger is the reason for man and the reason for redemption. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That love impels Him to call us to prayer. That call is the proof of our ability to stand in His presence. It is the proof of His making us righteous enough to stand in His presence without reproof or condemnation. It means that we are ever welcome to the throne room. How few of us have ever realized this. It is sons visiting their father. It is children coming joyously into the presence of a loving parent. He does not demand faith of His children. He doesn't say, now if you believe, or if you have faith, or if you love me. He said that to the Jews, His servants the men of the broken covenant. But he says to us, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is the Father's invitation to the throne room of love. Prayer is our need crying out for help. Prayer is the voice of faith to the Father. Prayer is born, then, of a sense of need and the assurance that the need will be met. Unbelief cannot pray. It can only utter words. Prayer is the living word in lips of faith. It is holding his word up to him in prayer like a mirror. He sees himself in his word. He said it. You are asking him to do it. He promised. You hold that promise up to him in prayer. You see, God and his word are one, just as he and Jesus are one. He honored his word by calling his son the word. His son then and the word are one. He was with the son and in the son. So he is in the word and with the word today. When we quote the word, we quote him. When we rest on the word, we rest on him. His word is my contact with him. His word in the lips of faith is he himself speaking. Then we are speaking his word back to him. We hold his word as a bank holds our note. Just as we have collateral to make the note good, God has ability to make his word good. Prayer then is facing God with man's needs, with his promise to meet those needs. He taught us to pray. He taught us to trust his word. Prayer is a part of God's program for us. He encourages us to act on his word. He is one with us in this prayer life. It is His way of saving, healing, and blessing men. Jesus said in Luke 18.1, Men ought always to pray and not to faint. I have two striking translations. Men ought always to pray and not turn out badly, or men ought always to pray and not cave in. You see, prayer means vital contact with the Father. We are near enough to Him to breathe in His very presence. Prayer means that we have come boldly into the throne room and are standing in His presence. It is more than bringing Him on the scene. It is going into the presence of the Father and Jesus in an executive meeting, laying our needs before Him and making our requisition for ability, for grace, healing for someone, or victory for someone, or for financial needs. Whatever that need may be, we are making a demand upon Him. One day, when the crowd was pressing around the Master, Jesus said, Someone has touched me. And they said, Master, the multitudes press thee and crush thee. But he answered, No, someone has made a demand upon my ability. 20th century translation. 
That is a beautiful translation, and it is so suggestive. There cannot be any touching of the master without the master knowing it. When need touches him, it makes a demand upon his ability to meet that need, and prayer is the way in which we touch him. Prayer keeps man in close contact with the Father and with the Word. It is a constant communion with the Father, and it enriches one spiritually. It illumines the Word and illumines the mind, and it freshens and heals the body. A strange feature about this prayer life is that it reaches to the uttermost parts of the earth. When I pray for a man in London or in Africa, my spirit can send to him through the Father the blessing that he needs today. It is the original wireless method. It is the original radio means of communication. I speak here, and they are instantly blessed there. What a ministry. Prayer is a spiritual exercise. Your spirit is contacting the Father. Your spirit is reaching other human spirits through the Father. Paul said, My spirit and the Lord Jesus will be with you in your deliberations. It doesn't seem credible. Sense knowledge can't grasp this. It is in the realm of the recreated spirit. We become so utterly one with him. We become so utterly ruled and governed by the Word and by the Holy Spirit that we become masters of demons and their works. We cast out demons with the Word. We pray for sick folks and the diseases leave them. Weakness is destroyed by the strength of God. The very life of God flows out through our lips. Do you remember John 7, 38 and 39, where Jesus says, He that believeth on me, as the Scripture hath said, from within him shall flow rivers of living water. 20th century translation, shall gush torrents of living water. Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence, and how, from our inner life of prayer, there gushes forth a torrent of the very life of God that speeds on its way to that one who is in need. No one knows about the fullness of this. We are in the very infancy of this prayer life. Electricity has made the wireless and the radio realities. Electricity is God's life in the mechanical world. Will that life in the mechanical world be stronger, more efficacious than His nature in our spirits? I can't believe it. I know that our prayers bring the very presence of God upon men in any part of the world. You see, this is cooperating with Him. God through you is ruling the demons and evil forces all over the world. You become His voice in that name. The Word really becomes the sword of the Spirit, and it is waging a war against demoniacal forces who rule men. His Word through your lips dominates these world forces. They don't know it, but they feel cramped, bound, hindered, conquered. Jesus said, In my name ye shall cast out demons. That means rule them, govern them. God through you then can sway the nations. Now you can understand 2 Corinthians 6 1, laboring together with him. How, through this marvelous prayer life, you have entered the holy priesthood in your prayer life. You can be God's voice, his spokesman, his ambassador, his underruler in Jesus' name, through the word in your lips. You become God's will toward a Satan-ruled world. You are taking Jesus' place. You are acting in his stead. Once more, God is set free among men. You remember that God gave to Adam dominion over all the universe. That dominion was restored to us through Jesus, but it is of no value to us unless we, the Jesus men, use that authority in his name. That authority was given to an individual, Adam. Now the authority is given to us as believers in the name. Jesus exercised that dominion. He ruled the sea. He ruled the fish. He ruled the human body. He made legs grow where they had been amputated. He fed the multitudes. Jesus did not exercise any authority or ability that is not latent in his name today. Someday there is going to rise a people who will take Jesus' place and bless humanity as Jesus blessed them in dear old Galilee. Did not Jesus say in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, All authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples, not converts, but students of the word of all nations. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of this age. He is with us in the word, that living word. He is with us in his name. He is with us in the presence of the Holy Spirit. We join forces with him in this prayer life. That all authority was given to him as the head of the church, and it is for the church to use. The authority that is in his name is in your lips. You let that authority loose. You give it liberty, and it blesses men. He has made us sons. He has given us the name. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He has restored all that Adam lost and more. We are Satan's rulers. We are masters of demons and laws that sin brought into being. Why did he redeem us? Why make us new creations? Why make us righteous? Why dwell in us? Why give us the name? Why say that in Jesus' name we could cast out demons? What did he expect us to do after making us all this? Just to be good, neutral sons who never face the enemy, who simply read the word but never act on it, who do not take our redemption and new creation seriously? Is he mocking us? Is his word like dry clouds in a drought? 
Is Satan invincible? Must we yield to Satan's dominion and Satan-ruled circumstances? Must we say that tanks, planes, and bombs are to rule the world? Or is God still living, and are we tied up with Him? I can feel God's question there. He is saying to me, Have you taken these facts as seriously as your nation has taken the draft laws? Is my redemption and new creation as real as the taxes? Does it mean anything? We must face this issue. We are surrounded by demoniacal forces that are dominating the human on earth. And if the church has not authority over these, then no one has. But the church has, and prayer is our method and mode of dominating these diabolical forces that are wrecking civilization, taking our place. Every one of us has a place in the prayer life. God has no unused members. There isn't a useless member of the physical body. Neither is there in the spiritual body of Christ. God has planned with divine wisdom the body of Christ. And the moment that you are born into that body, you have your place in which to function. If anyone thinks that because of lack of training or for lack of this or that, he hasn't a place, he is deluded by the enemy. You have a place. With that place comes responsibility, and with responsibility comes a reward or demerit. If you do not take your place in the family of God, in the church, and begin to function, the body of Christ is weakened because of it. Some have the idea that their special vocation is to criticize others because they are not doing more. The Holy Spirit is the only one who has this position. You have no right to set yourself up as a critic. Your business is to find your place and fill it. Until you do, you will pay the price. I want you to know, my brother, my sister, that the price you pay for staying out of the will of God is expensive. You may pay it in sickness, in loss of money, or in unhappiness with your loved ones. For you can't be the protected one, the cared for one, as long as you are standing outside of the Lord's will for you. Take your place. Give yourself to meditation, prayer, and study of the Word. Don't allow anything to stand in the way of your finding your place. Life will not mean much to you outside of His will. The big thing of life is to be in the will of the Father. You say you were never called to give your life in prayer? No, you may not have been set apart by the Spirit for this special ministry, but I think it would be wise for you to spend enough time in prayer to get acquainted with the Father. Luke 18.1 There are only two ways of getting acquainted, through the Word and by prayer. If you don't take time to pray, you are losing out. You can't say that you have no responsibility in the prayer life, for you have. To see a need is to have a call to prayer. There are people who will be utterly lost unless you take your place. Unless you do your part, men will cry against you through eternity. You can't plead that you have too much work to do. You can pray while you work. You can't put up the plea that you do not know how. You can learn if you wish. For you to disobey the prayer call is for you to disobey the call of your Father. The prayer responsibility today is the most important thing of our lives. Did you ever realize that there are men and women who are defeated and are breaking down in their business, home, and spiritual life because we haven't prayed? Let me change it. Because you haven't prayed? You have been occupied with your pleasures and your dreams, and men and women staggering under the burdens you should have carried are breaking down. Oh God, have mercy upon us. As you read this, do not read it simply to awaken you for the moment, but let prayer become your eating or your business, or your home. If you are a mother or a wife and live at home, there are certain duties which you perform every day for your family. The greatest duty that you will ever perform for your family will be the prayer duty. It may be that it is no longer a privilege. You have thrown the privilege away. You have ignored it. It has now become a stern duty. You must go back to your prayer closet and begin anew your fellowship with Him. Do it for the sake of your family, the boys and girls for the sake of your home and church, and God will honor you. Children are growing up in Christian homes without the restraining power of God over their lives. The reason is apparent. Mothers and fathers have failed in their responsibilities in the prayer life. I call on you men and women who yourselves are to blame for the crime and the lawlessness of the youth of this generation to go and ask His forgiveness and to take up your responsibilities now in His presence. Way back yonder in the garden, the first man lived in the presence of the Creator, Jehovah God. He had no sense of unfitness or need of fitness. He was like a child who climbs up into his father's arms. The child has no sense of fear, no sense of need, for he belongs. And because he belongs, he takes his place. He takes liberties. But when the great blunder was made and Adam, in a foolish moment, sold out his vast privileges and rights to an enemy, he was driven away from the presence, and a flaming sword was at the gateway to keep him out. That garden of desire with its tree of life was known to all the people, and for thousands of years, until the flood came, and yet no one could get into the presence of God. Then Jehovah separated Abraham, cut the covenant with him, giving a promise of the Messiah to come through him. His descendants were also given a law and a priesthood, and they cut the covenant with Jehovah through the priest. God dwelt in their midst in the Holy of Holies. 
No one could approach him unless he was covered by a cloud of incense and had in his hand a basin of blood to sprinkle on the mercy seat, and that was only to be done once a year by the appointed priest. Israel was a servant. The unapproachable presence was in the Holy of Holies. The heart of man was just as hungry after God as it had been the day that Adam was driven out of the garden. The heart hunger of man has given us all the religions of the old world, all the religions of the East. It has also given us the modern philosophical and metaphysical religions. Man's heart hunger is one of his most outstanding features, a very badge of the human. But you mustn't think for a moment that the hunger is all on one side. God's child-hungry and love-hungry heart created a universe, put in the center of it a world to be a home for his man, and he created man after his own image and likeness, an eternal being, and you know how that man failed him. All down through human history is the trail of man's hunger and of God's outreaching toward that spirit-hungry man until the man Jesus came. The incarnation of Jesus is the master stroke of love. It was God's intrusion into the sense realm where man began to live when driven from the garden. God unveiled himself to the senses of the Jewish nation. They had no spiritual appreciation because they were spiritually dead. Jesus, in his earth walk, revealed to the men of the senses who surrounded him a strange, a phenomenal thing. He talked with God Almighty, the God of the Jews, with a sense of intimacy that they couldn't understand. And finally, he called their God his Father. To them, that was blasphemy, and they stoned him for it. They hounded him until finally they took him before Pontius Pilate and accused him, saying, He makes God his father. That's blasphemy, and he ought to die. Jesus paid the price of confessing God as his father. But before he did that, one day he said, as recorded in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. I remember that Acts 9, 2 is the story of Paul's being sent to Damascus with authority to arrest any that he found who are of the way. And then in Acts 19:9. But when some were hardened and disobedient, speaking evil of the way before the multitude. Acts 19.23 And about that time there arose no small stir concerning the way. Acts 18.26 tells the story of how Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos, a disciple of John the Baptist, who had not yet heard of Jesus, and they expounded unto him the way of God. The same thought is brought out again in Acts 22.4 And I persecuted this way unto the death. Paul here is standing before the people of Jerusalem, telling how he had persecuted the way. Paul is again defending himself in Acts 24.14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call a sect, so serve I the God of our fathers. These scriptures were puzzling. Why did he call it the way? The Holy Spirit, this signifying that the way into the holy place hath not yet been made manifest, while the first tabernacle is yet standing. Hebrews 9.8 This began to throw light on it as the way into the Holy of Holies. But Hebrews 10, 19, and 20 clears it up. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the way which he dedicated for us, a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now we can understand it. The new way that Paul preached was the way into God's presence. Way back yonder, Adam lost the way. Jesus came to point it out. He said, I am the way, I am the reality, and I am the new kind of life. Now in Hebrews 4.16, he tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. That means to come boldly into the holy of holies, to come with freedom into the very presence of God. Now our hearts can understand Mark 15.38, and the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Josephus tells us that that wonderful veil was four inches thick and 15 feet square, made of the finest dyed linen, inwrought with threads of gold. It shielded the holy of holies so that no one could enter but the high priest and he but once a year, in a cloud of incense with a bowl of blood to make the yearly atonement for the nation. Now an angel has come, and the curtain is rent not from the bottom, but from the top, showing that God has been there, and ripped that curtain apart, throwing the Holy of Holies open, not to the high priest only, but to everyone whom the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed. In other words, God the Father is no longer shut in alone. He can be approached, he can be met. But that isn't all. Try to imagine yourself a Jew back yonder, under that first covenant, and you know that no Jew could approach God and live. Nadab and Abihu were struck dead upon the portals when they attempted to go into God's presence uninvited. It was upon that great festival day when the priesthood had just been set apart by Moses. Aaron's two beautiful sons lay dead. Leviticus 10, 1 through 3. From that day on, no man ever attempted to enter the Holy of Holies except a king. He was struck with leprosy as he entered the holy place, attempting to go into the Holy of Holies, and he lived in a leper house the rest of his life. 
For anyone to touch the Ark of the Covenant meant death, as it did to David's friend, who dared put his hand up to steady it, when the oxen had jarred the vehicle that bore it. Now Jesus said, I am going to be the way into the presence of the Father. Men are going to be able to enter into his presence. Can't you see what that would mean to the prayer life? Here is the secret of prayer. We have utterly failed to grasp the significance of the heart hunger of the Father. He longs for our companionship. John 14:23 gives us an illustration. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Does your heart grasp it? Jesus said, The Father and I will come and make our home with you. He is no longer in the Holy of Holies. The sin problem has been settled. Man has received eternal life, has become his very child. Now his great heart of love says, I want to come and make my home with you. Can you see what lies back of this? There has been a restored righteousness. Man has become righteous. He can stand in the Father's presence without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or inferiority. And on the basis of this righteousness, man has fellowship. This is the object of the heart reason for the entire redemptive program. What would relationship mean without fellowship? God could make man his son, but if that son didn't have fellowship with the father, then there is no joy for the heart of either. Fellowship really means drinking out of the same cup. It was like our old-fashioned communion table, where the pastor or elders passed a cup, and each one of us took a sip of the wine. That was a type of communion. Now the father has called us into communion with his son. We drink together. Can't you hear him say, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will drink with him. Revelation 3.20 Now, what does it mean to us? It means that the last barrier between the father and the children has been put away. We may come into his presence now with the same freedom that Jesus had. Now we can see what prayer can mean. It isn't the old idea of getting on our knees and crying and begging. It is a son coming into the father's presence for one of our brethren who has been injured or for one who for some reason cannot come and make his appeal personally. We come on his behalf and asking for a blessing. Or it may be that we are taking up the need of the great unsaved world. We stand there in fullness of fellowship and fullness of joy to get a portion for another. This is entering by the new and living way. This is coming boldly to the throne of grace. This is fellowshipping the Father. This is visiting with him. It is not coming into his presence as the Jews came into the presence of Jehovah or as a sinner would approach, but we are coming as sons and daughters. We are taking our place. 1 Peter 2, 3 through 5 gives us a picture of our holy priesthood. If ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious unto whom coming a living stone, rejected indeed of men, but with God elect, precious, ye also as living stones are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. It is our holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to the Father through Jesus Christ. That is our daily worship, our daily fellowship with Him. We always come to our Father in the name of His beloved Son. We come with thanksgiving. We come with worship. We come with love. We bring the fruit of lips. Would that our hearts could understand what this means. Our words are the fruit of the vine. I am the vine, and ye are the branches, Jesus said. And here is the lip fruit. Our words come from which the wine of life can be made. How it does touch our hearts to think that he drinks of the fruit of our lips. Jesus said, I am that living water. Now we can understand that. Hebrews 13, 15 makes us know as we never did the holy privilege of speech. Through him, let us offer up a sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of lips which make confession to his name. Now we can understand what it means to come into his presence. You come with your petitions. You come with your heartaches. You come with your burden, and he partakes of the fruit of your lips. Oh, how priceless are your words to him. The rent veil, the tender heart invitation to come boldly to the throne of grace, all mean something to us now. We are coming in through the living way that Jesus opened by his great sacrifice, by his victory over the adversary that made our new birth possible, and our standing as sons a reality. Ours is a twofold priesthood. We are not only a holy priesthood, but we are a royal priesthood. This is pictured in 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But ye are an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that ye may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who in time past were no people, but now are the people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. This is our public ministry. Whether it be a layman or a preacher, we are showing forth in our daily walk, in our conversation, the fruits of this royal priesthood. You see, we belong to the throne. 
We belong to royalty, and we are showing forth His excellencies. We are advertising His love, His grace, His long-suffering. We are advertising eternal life, His very nature. We belong to royalty. Is it any wonder that we have access to the throne? Is it any wonder that we can come boldly to the throne of grace? We are walking up the new and living way. Chapter the Second The Prayer Habit Prayer should be as natural as breathing and as enjoyable as eating. Prayer should be as unconscious as our communication with each other. It should not be the child of need, but should be based on a spiritual fellowship with the Father and with the Master, so that our needs are His needs. For we are not our own, we are a part of Him. Our body is not our own. The property we control is not our own. Our abilities are not our own. They are all His. So we are laboring together with Him, and what we have considered personal needs are really His needs. The work that we are doing is His work, so that prayer is not what we have thought it was, but it is a fellowship, a sharing. It is a community interest. We are one in this, just as the vine and the branch are one. The branch cannot bear fruit alone, and the vine cannot bear fruit without the branch. So prayer is simply talking it over with Him, getting His views, His will, His plans, and our carrying out those plans with His grace, ability, and wisdom. Habits are children of our choices. We are what we make ourselves. This prayer habit will be born of your own will. This habit is hard to form for most people. It should never be a duty, for just as we do not enjoy those who visit us because it is their duty, so it is with the Father. We want those who love us to come because they cannot help it. Prayer is a visit with our Father. We should think of it as a rare opportunity. The names that are familiar to us in God's Westminster Abbey of the Church are the names of those who pray, men and women who have climbed the mountains of usefulness in the struggle with circumstances through prayer. There is no denying that the lack of prayer is the bane of the individual member of the body of Christ. Jesus was a man of prayer. He taught prayer, not as a slavish duty, but as a glorious privilege. I used to wonder why he needed to pray. He took his human place and lived the human life. I have a conviction that he didn't draw upon the secret resources that belong to him more than it is possible for us who live and walk in his name. Jesus' ministry and healing illustrated what our prayer life may do for us. He didn't exercise his divine prerogatives during his three years' ministry any more than any child of God may exercise them. He had a human body. He had the limitations that go with the incarnation. The believer is a new creation, created in Christ Jesus. He is brought into the family of God. He is an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. He is a child of God. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in his body. Plus this, Jesus has given him the power of attorney to use his name. The more that I study the life of Jesus, I am convinced that he did not exercise divine power in excess of what every intelligent child of God possesses today. The difference is that Jesus knew what belonged to him, and Jesus used his rights. We do not know what belongs to us. Not knowing what is ours, we cannot use our rights. When Jesus cast out demons, he used authority that he has delegated to the church. He said, In my name you shall cast out demons. The forces of hell could not touch him or injure him. He was simply using the divine ability that is delegated to us. You shall take up serpents, and they shall not injure you. The poison of vipers has no power over the Christian body who knows his place in Christ. The Apostle Paul loosened the deadly fangs of a viper that had fastened itself into his hand and shook the thing off without injury. Paul simply illustrated what Jesus had promised. Let me state it again. I am convinced that intelligent children of the Lord could walk in the same life and power and divine liberty as Jesus walked if they understood their privileges. He said, If ye shall drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm you. Poison could not be administered to the Lord Jesus and take effect. It cannot be administered to the body of Christ and take effect if the members of that body walk in the knowledge and liberty of the sons of God. This is not extreme. It is simply walking in the realm of life. We have been translated out of the realm of darkness. That is the kingdom of weakness, darkness, and ignorance. We have been translated into the kingdom of the Son of His love, which is the realm of wealth, of life, of light, joy, of peace, and of faith. Let me state it again. Jesus, in His earth walk, as the incarnate Son of God, beginning with His baptism, lived exactly as every child of God should live today. God wasn't any more His Father than He is ours. He said, The Father loveth you even as He loves me. He was the Son of God. You are a Son of God. He was deity. You are a partaker of the divine nature. That is deity. He had the Holy Spirit dwelling in him. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. The difference is that Jesus gave the Holy Spirit right of way, in a sense of which we have never yet learned. He took advantage of the God life within him in a way that we have never yet been able to take advantage of the God life within us. But you say, Jesus was not mortal as we are. That is true. 
But by faith the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Our bodies shall not have dominion over us as we walk in the realm of God. Again, Paul says that our bodies are dead, have lost their mortal effectiveness in reigning over our spirits. I believe that God planned that we should walk in the fullness of the divine life, that we should dare to take our position as sons and daughters of God, and that the hour is coming before the Lord's return in which a remnant of the body will rise and walk before God the Father in the fullness of the new creation life. Disease will not be able to lay hold upon us. Ignorance and fear will be vanished, because the wisdom that comes from above, that is in Jesus, will lead us into the full dream, ambitions, and purposes of our Father. Now I want you to notice that God has made Jesus to be our redemption. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 7, "...in whom we have our redemption." 1 Corinthians 1.30 declares that He is our redemption. You dare to measure that. You dare to set limits on that. The limits of that redemption are the limits of Jesus. He was made unto us wisdom from God. The limits of that wisdom are the limits of the eternal Son of God. He has made unto us sanctification. The limits of that sanctification are the limits of Jesus. He is our life, and the limits of that life are the limits of the life of the Son of God. You see, our feeble reasoning has pushed faith out of the arena. The devil can combat successfully against our reason. But if faith gets reason's place, Satan is whipped. The great body of the most advanced Bible teachers today are held in the bondage of sense knowledge. Their interpretations are often evasions. Because of the opinions of men, they dare not take their real place. Consequently, the word of God has little effect. Let us humbly and fearlessly, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, take our place. If we are new creations, created in Christ Jesus, let us ask the Father to set the limits of that new creation, instead of allowing theologians to do it. Faith will lead you where reason cannot walk. Reason has never been a mountain climber. Faith like a mountain sheep can scale the loftiest mountain peaks without fear. I offer this as a subject for meditation, not controversy. I offer this as a contribution after years of heart-searching, of outreaching after the bigger, fuller life in Christ. I know it is not in the realm of reason. But I know it is where faith walks and God is challenging us in these last days to get the light and the knowledge that will fit us for the closing of this dispensation. The message that John Wesley brought was truth, but it was only part of the truth. Calvin had only a little of the light. There have been revelations continually from the Word during these hundreds of years. Don't you think it's time that we passed out of the swaddling clothes period into the stature of the perfect man in Christ Jesus? So let us dare to climb the heights of God. Let us say without fear, I am what he says I am. He is in me what he says he is. I can do with his ability in me what he says I can. This makes life big and rich. This makes us worthwhile to him. This will make us partners with him. We will be in that prized inner circle with him, one of the trusted ones. When he has a difficult mission, he will call on us. You see, he will find it easy to reach us as we constantly visit him. Take your place. Enjoy your rights. All kinds of prayer. Ephesians 6, 10, Moffat, Hold your ground, tighten the shield of truth about you. Wear integrity as your coat of mail. Have your feet shod with the stability of the gospel of peace. Above all, take faith as your shield to enable you to quench the fire-tip darts flung by the evil one. Put on salvation as your helmet. Take the spirit as your sword. That is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty. Be alive to that. Attend to it unceasingly. You will notice by this translation that the object of the Christian soldier's coat of mail or armor is that he may enter the prayer fight. Preaching and personal work are God-honored and blessed vocations or ministries, but prayer is the foundation of it all. A man might preach with the eloquence of a beecher and be the most skilled of diplomats as a soul winner but he will fall short of his ministry in both fields if he isn't backed up by the prayer life. The failure of all Christian enterprises is a prayer failure. Prayer alone gives success. There are many different kinds of prayer. There is simple petition, lifting its sentences in Jesus' name to the heart of love. There is persistent, tenacious prayer that will not yield until the answer comes. There is prevailing prayer that overcomes every obstacle that finally lands the answer in the harbor of peace. There is battle prayer with its tears and agony, its intense yearning. There is the quiet prayer of faith, whose voice is never lifted above a whisper, but whose persistent faith shakes the very throne of heaven. There is prayer without ceasing that seems to perfume every act of the persistent prayer. Then there is the unconscious prayer attitude. Paul says by the Spirit, praying with all kinds of prayer. How desperately the nation needs it. How desperately the church needs it. Nothing can take the place of prayer. Every believer should go into the school of prayer with Christ and actually learn the secret of prayer, the precious ministry of intercession. 
The prayer of intercession is the prayer for another, not for self. It is the prayer that passes out from your domain, your realm, into the realm of another. Jesus ever lives to make intercession at the right hand of the Father. The Holy Spirit in us, oft times, makes intercession that cannot be uttered in words. Oft times, we are depressed, we cannot understand it, or see any reason for it. It is the Holy Spirit in agony, reaching through us to the Father. If our spirits were only fruitful, perhaps we could understand the language and the agony of the Spirit in His mighty outreaching toward the throne of grace. If our lives were only more perfectly under His sway, He might be able to breathe His passion through our conscious faculties in His mighty agony for lost men and women. Oft times, our spirits are dull, and He cannot communicate His passion and yearning through them to our minds. So it becomes unintelligible agony, groanings that cannot be uttered. I suppose this is the reason why certain men and women are led to become the prayer channels for a whole congregation. So few of us in our busy lives take time to pray that the Spirit searches through the congregation for the willing hearts that will deny themselves some of the common pleasures and will be first in the line of prayer instead of last. On these willing hearts rolls the burden of the entire church. Thank God that in our church are found those who are willing to set aside whole nights of prayer, who will leave the joy of visiting with loved ones and hide away alone with Him, to take my burden and yours that we have in some way failed to roll on the Lord. They encompass our Jericho with their persistent intercession. It is a pity that more of us do not force ourselves into a life of prayer. We have the time. We use it in useless talk or careless reading. While the Spirit is searching for an outlet, He must pass us by because we are not ready. Oh, I beseech you, reader, not to talk about it any more or plan when you will do it, but begin it now. Force yourself into the prayer life, regardless of how you feel. Drive yourself to prayer. You will be amazed how halting and stumbling will be your first attempts. You have been rated, perhaps, as an unusual Christian worker in the church. Men look at you as an outstanding Christian, but if they knew that in behind your public profession there was an empty closet or an unused prayer room, they would be amazed. If you live with the Lord in secret, you will be able to pray with great freedom in public. Unconsciously, we call upon the people to pray who are on praying terms with the Lord. Seldom will a spiritual mind reach out to an unspiritual life for help. It is only when we are clutching at straws that we do it. You see, prayer has several elements. It brings you into personal fellowship and touch with the Father and with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus. All three of the Godhead are brought into the prayer life. You are praying to the Father. You are praying in the name of Jesus. You are praying through the Holy Spirit. Your prayer is based upon the Word. It brings this earth heart of ours into contact with the heavenly center of all divine power and activity. You can't spend any length of time in prayer without being affected by it. The quietness, the unshaken faith, the deep, unsounded peace that pervades the Godhead will overflow into the prayer's life. Said an anxious and nervous mother, You will have to forgive me, children, but I forgot to visit the Master this morning, and so I lack his quietness and his strength. Many of us can make that confession, that our irritability, weakness, and lack of spiritual insight comes from not sitting in the presence of the Master. One cannot spend an hour in conscious communion with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the Word, without carrying away from the trysting place the fragrance that fills the atmosphere. There is a heavenly fragrance about Jesus that lingers with the prayers. They are slow to speak. They are slow to judge. They are quick to love and quick to help. There is a holy calmness about their lives that challenges the restless ones. They crave that quietness of the Spirit. Again, we cannot spend time with them without partaking of their stability and their unshakableness. One who is easily disturbed and who is in the jolt of life is unseated will find a new strength and steadiness that will make him a blessing to the world by spending just a little time with the rock of our strength. You see, a few moments with him tunes us up, fills the battery, adjusts the carburetor, and makes it easy for us to face life's uneven conditions. It gives us poise and holy dignity in our contacts. Faith makes us an intelligent victor. Faith makes mountains and difficulties take their true position. You can't sit with the God of all faith and all love for one half hour each day without unconsciously breathing in the faith of God. What would it mean to you if Jesus should come into your home as he came into the home of Mary and Martha? You would take time to visit with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. John 14, 23. You love him, invite him into your home, and then get acquainted with him. Learn to talk things over with him. He is there. Visit with Him. Remember, He loves you, is interested in all your problems. He will make His Word answer every question. He will make Himself real in your life and home. Prayer on a winning basis. He made prayer a winning business proposition. We didn't ask Him to do it. We didn't send our representative and say, Now, Father, we want you to give us certain promises and certain abilities. 
No, he did it all. He planned it all for us. He based a prayer life upon his own word. It was a daring thing for him to do, but he believed that we would believe. He dared to give his son. He dared to give man eternal life. He dared to make us new creations. Why? Because he believed that man would respond to his love, and that man, when challenged by such grace, would meet it with a glad response. And so we are fellowshipping him in his faith fight for a lost race. We are helping the men for whom his son died and has redeemed. Our combat is warring against God's enemy. It is saving the men for whom Christ died. It is making strong the weak. It is giving God's children a chance for winning in life's fight. We are the instruments. We are the forerunners. We are the pioneers in this marvelous life of faith. We are joining the men of all ages who have dared to walk where paths have never been. We are opening channels for His grace to reach the human race. We are God's under-engineers. We are building roads for others to walk upon. Our faith life is joined with God's faith life, and we have become His tilled land, His fellow workers. We are the branches that are bearing the real fruit from the real vine. We are opening channels through which He can pour Himself out on man. Our ministry is not a failure. We are winning. We are making out of these failure men successes. Our union with Him is beckoning other men to dare come into the union too. They see failures transfigured into successes. They see men who have been held for years absolute slaves to narcotics and drink, set free to walk in the fullness of their liberty in Christ. And those in bondage reach their hands out for help, and our Father grasps them and lifts them up onto the solid rock. Come on, you prayers. Join this mighty group of intercessors who are making the desert place blossom like the rose. Come on, you men and women who have never made prayer a business. Make your investment of time. Learn the art. Yes, the secret of this great business of the age. Throw yourself open. Let him pour himself through you until your home and your business and your associates will feel the throb of his mighty life and the lift of his love. Let me state it with all the simplicity possible, that you can't have prayers answered without having miracles performed. Prayer and Miracles If you deny that miracles are for this age, you deny the need and the privileges and the benefits of prayer. The twofold value of prayer lies first in sitting in His presence, or in direct fellowship with the Father. The second benefit is the answer that comes to us. John says, If we ask anything according to His will, we know that He heareth us, and if we know that He hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked. For God the Father to hear my prayer is equivalent to His answering it. Now for God to hear me is a miracle. For God to answer my prayer, regardless of its nature, is a miracle. Whether my petition is for a postage stamp or for a million dollars, it is a miracle. Any divine intervention, any arrest of the laws of nature that comes in answer to faith is a miracle. If prayer brings an answer, that answer is a miracle. It is then that faith has its true place. The instant that you say there are no miracles in this dispensation, you deny that our walk is a walk by faith, and you declare that our walk is a walk by reason. I challenge you to find one place where God tells us, as believers, to walk by reason. God is a faith God. We are a faith family. We are all born by faith. We live by faith. By faith we live, breathe, and have our being in Christ. If there are no miracles, then there is no reason for faith. If there are no miracles, God can't answer prayer, because He can't answer prayer of any character that is not a miracle. You men and women who tell me that you believe the Bible to be the Word of God, that it is God-breathed and without error in the original, and then, in the same breath, tell me that the day of miracles is past. You are the most illogical thinkers, the most inconsistent believers that the devil ever deluded. I believe profoundly that the devil is the deceiver of the whole inhabited earth, and of that type of Christian in particular. So let us reverently come back to God. Let us take our place. If we pray at all, we expect prayer to be answered. If that prayer is answered, God has done it. And if God has answered prayer, He has performed something outside of the realm of reason. We will have to give up our prayer life utterly, or we will have to believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. I believe in divine intervention. I believe that the prayer of faith reaches God our Father, and when it reaches Him, He acts in response to that faith. When He acts in response to our faith, His action is above our reason. It is the realm of miracles. For me to deny the privilege and benefits of prayer would raise a storm of protest among those who deny miracles today. I want you to see, my brother, as you read this today, that your position is untenable. Faith causes a man to act like God. Love makes him like God. The supernatural. Prayer is an excursion into the supernatural realm. You are in the throne room, in the presence of God of all ability. He has promised to hear your petition and to give you your request. You have come on the ground of his word. He said, Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give it you. You understand that the words that Jesus spoke were his Father's words. 
So you come now with the Father's words in your lips, and you are making your appeal on the ground of His own words, taking a son's place. You are not a servant. You are not a slave. You are a son. You are taking Jesus' place, acting in His stead, doing the Father's will. You may know that you are the Father's will just as Jesus was the Father's will. Because of His own will, He begat you. You are the fruit of His own word. You came into being by His own power and ability. You have received eternal life in His very nature. You recognize your place in Christ. You are acting the part of a son. The great unsaved world must know what He has done for them in Christ. And so you are taking His ability, doing your part in the saving of men as Jesus did His part. You belong to a supernatural order of being, whether you recognize it or not, whether you have taken your place or not. You have the ability of the indwelling presence. You have the wisdom that Jesus had in His earth walk, because Jesus has been made unto you wisdom. You can think of yourself as linked up with ability, linked with omnipotence. You remember, He said, and nothing shall be impossible to you. I know that sense knowledge reasoning shrinks from this, but here is where the challenge of grace leads you. We dare to take our place, dare to confess what we are, Dare to confess that He made us what we are, that we can do what He says we can do, because He is at work within us. We have His Word that He is in us. The latent ability and energy within us is His who gave it to us. This makes the prayer life a master thing. You are not asking for the possible. You are always praying for the impossible. You are asking for things that can't be done by any human method. Chapter the Third how faith is built. Fasting and long hours of prayer do not build faith. Reading books about faith and about men of faith and their exploits stirs in the heart a deep passion for faith, but does not build faith. The Word alone is the source of faith. But the Word will not build faith unless it becomes a part of us. If ye abide in me and my words have their place in you, that is, they have their place in our conduct. Jesus gave us the key. He said, The words that I speak are not mine, but my Father's. And the works that he did were not his but his father's. Jesus acted on his father's words. Jesus never needed faith. He had it unconsciously. Faith is built in us by the word being built into us, by our acting upon it. It is the word of faith. And so as the father builds that into us in our daily walk, faith becomes an unconscious asset. We come to realize that we are a part of him as a branch is a part of the vine, that he is a part of us as the vine is a part of the branch, that we have his life, we have his ability, we have his love nature, we have his strength. That gives us an unconscious certainty as we go into His presence. We know that we are working together with Him to one common end. We know that He is the strength of our life. We know that He is our ability. We know that we are His righteousness in Christ. We know that He needs us to carry out His will, and so we are taking our place as a son carrying out His dream for man. There cannot be a real prayer life that is not built upon the Word. The Word is the source of all faith. The faith must be a quiet reassurance, an unconscious faith, something that you do not even think about. You can't conceive of Jesus saying to himself, If I only had faith. Men and women who have really wrought mighty things have been those who never thought about their faith life. The word was a reality. What he said solved the problem. This word is revelation knowledge. It is God deigning to speak with man, the reality of the incarnation. First, there must be a reality of the incarnation, John 1.14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Incarnation cannot be a doctrine or a theory or a metaphysical concept. It must be as real as your birth is to you, not something to argue about, but an absolute fact that God has broken into the human realm and has given to the senses a testimony of His reality. I can never forget when I knew actually that God had been and was manifest in the flesh. I had an unconscious background of doubt that disappeared and another background of absolute certainty took its place. Reality of His Resurrection Many of us have reveled in His earth walk, following Him step by step in His miraculous career. We were thrilled at the demonstrations of divine ability that characterized Him in every crisis. He faced a dead Lazarus as simply as you and I would face any ordinary event in life. He was perfectly quiet in the midst of the storm on the Sea of Galilee. He walked on the waves that night amid the tumult of a raging storm as quietly as you walk up and down on the sidewalk in front of your home. There was a royalty about his faith, a divine dignity that thrills us. But was he raised from the dead? He raised others. Was he raised? I fought this for years. It was an unknown battle to those about me. I used to say, if he was actually raised from the dead, then his deity and his substitutionary work are realities. 
One day, as I was reading John 20, 1 through 10, I saw the miracle. The problem of the resurrection of Jesus centers first around the question, was he dead? Or, as one skeptic declares, he had swooned. John 19, 30 through 34, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross upon the Sabbath, for the day of that Sabbath was a high day, asked of Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. The soldiers, therefore, came and brake the legs of the first and of the other that was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. Howbeit one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and straightway there came out blood and water. The Roman spearhead was four or five inches wide, and when he stood there underneath the master and thrust the spear up into the side of Jesus, it must have penetrated the sack that holds the heart. What had happened? Jesus had died. The body had grown cold. His heart had ruptured. When he uttered that cry, it is finished. And out through the rupture in the heart flowed the blood into the sack until it was filled. The body rapidly grows cold. As it does, the blood separates, the white serum settles to the bottom, and the red corpuscles rise to the top. And as the body grows colder, the red corpuscles coagulate. When the spear pierced the sac that held the blood, the white serum or water flowed out. Then the red corpuscles slowly oozed out and rolled down the side of his body onto the ground. Jesus was dead. As soon as the master was dead, loving hearts began to prepare for his burial. John 19.38 and after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked of Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took away his body. You understand that in every family among the wealthy Jews, there was a slave who understood embalming, for that class always embalmed their loved ones. John 19, 39 and 40. And there came also Nicodemus, who at the first came to him by night, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. The body was first washed, and then the cloth was torn up into narrow strips and smeared with the sticky substance. Each finger and toe, hand and foot, was wrapped with these strips, until the legs and arms and body were completely encased in this sticky substance. The head and the neck were completely covered, except the face. When it was finished over the chest and torso, there was an inch to an inch and a half of this cloth covered with that sticky substance. The body was then put into Joseph's tomb. The climate was about the same as they have in Southern California. In a few hours, the embalming garment would become a solid mass, and Jesus' body would be completely imprisoned in the grave clothes. If he were not dead, this would cause him to die. The face was yet to be embalmed. Loved ones laid a napkin upon his face heavily saturated with something to preserve the face until the third day when loving hands would finish the embalming. Jesus was dead. The Roman government had pronounced him dead. The soldiers had pronounced him dead. The Jews knew he was dead. John 20, 1 through 10. Now on the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, while it was yet dark, unto the tomb, and seeth the stone taken away from the tomb. She runneth therefore, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter, therefore, went forth, and the other disciple, and they went toward the tomb, and they ran both together, and the other disciple outran Peter, and came first to the tomb. And stooping and looking in, he seeth the linen cloths lying, yet entered he not in. Simon Peter, therefore, also cometh, following him, and entered into the tomb. And he beholdeth the linen cloths lying, and the napkin that was upon his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then entered in, therefore, the other disciple also, who came first to the tomb, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away again unto their own home. You notice carefully the ninth and tenth verse. They knew not that Jesus must rise again from the dead. None of them believed in his resurrection. So you can understand their surprise when Mary came to the house where Peter and John were stopping and cried, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we know not where they have laid him. Nothing was more sacred to the Jews than the dead. Mary had been filled with anger and sorrow that someone had dared to desecrate the tomb. Peter and John ran together. John is younger, lighter of foot. He outruns his heavier partner and arrives at the tomb first. It was a sepulcher cut out of a solid ledge. John stops and reverently looks into the darkened tomb. Peter comes, just bows his head, and enters the tomb. John follows. The grave clothes are lying there on the floor. He sees the napkin that was upon Jesus' face, folded up and lying on a niche in the tomb. John 28 says, Then entered in therefore the other disciple also, who came first to the tomb, 
and he saw and believed. What did he see? He saw the empty cocoon lying there upon the floor. It had become so hard and stiff that it would almost support one's knee as you pressed upon it, but it was empty. The body of Jesus had come out of that little narrow aperture at the face. If John had seen that someone with a knife had ripped the cocoon open and taken the body of Jesus, he would never have believed. The empty cocoon convinced John that Jesus was risen from the dead. In my imagination, I had been with Peter and John when Mary came with her anger and distress, crying, They have taken away the body. I had gone with them to the tomb. I had stood there in my imagination, looking into the tomb. I entered into the tomb with John, and I saw what John saw, and for the first time in my life I knew that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. It has never been a theological dogma since that hour. Jesus was raised from the dead. But what does that resurrection mean? That the sin problem was settled, that Satan was conquered, humanity was redeemed, that God can now, on legal grounds, impart his nature, eternal life to man, and make him a new creation. At last, man can become God's actual child, a very son. There can be perfect fellowship between them. When God imparted his nature to man, he imparted his righteousness. So man is a partaker of the divine nature and the righteousness of God. Man can stand in the Father's presence, as did Jesus in his earth walk. Now God can give the Holy Spirit to live permanently in the body of this new creation. And he can build into that new creation, through the word, the very character and nature of the incarnate one, so that we can say softly, It is no longer I that live, but Christ liveth in me. Now I know that Romans 4.25 is a reality who was delivered up on the account of my trespasses and raised because I was justified. Literal translation. Reality of His Redemption The Church has had a theological conception of our redemption. It has never been a part of our daily walk. Colossians 1, 13 and 14, who delivered us out of the authority of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have our redemption. And Ephesians 1, 7 says that that redemption is according to the riches of His grace. In the mind of the Father, that redemption is a reality. It would have been a total failure otherwise. That redemption meant that Satan had been utterly defeated, stripped of his authority and dominion, so that any man, no matter what his condition has been, how deeply he has been enmeshed in sin, can by whispering the name of Jesus and by confessing his lordship, step out of bondage into perfect liberty. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you, or Satan shall not lord it over you. It has made the new man, the new creation, a master of sin. In the name of Jesus, the weakest child of God is an absolute master of Satan and demons. That redemption is a reality. You who have received eternal life, as you read this, can whisper, I am free. The Son has made me free. And I am free in reality. John 8.36 Most of these verses are literal translation, or copied from some of our modern translations. That redemption is a reality to the man who knows his place in Christ. You cannot be in Christ and not be free from the dominion of the devil. Reality of the new creation. What substitutions we have had for the new creation. We have called it forgiveness of sins, being converted, getting religion, joining the church, and many others. It is just one thing. A new creation, a child of God, a partaker of the divine nature. These all represent the one fact that you have passed out of death, satanic nature, into life, the realm of God. That is not just forgiveness of sins, but it is the impartation of a new nature. The old self, the old man was crucified with Christ. A new man was resurrected. And when you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and confessed Him as Lord, God imparted His own nature, eternal life to you, and you became a new species, a new man over which Satan has no dominion. Reality in Jesus' name. How little we have appreciated this. It is one of the greatest gifts the church has ever had given her. Before Jesus left us, He gave to the church a legal right to the use of His name. John 15, 16. Whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, He will give it you. John 16, 23 and 24. Note this translation. And in that day you shall not pray to me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you shall ask anything of the Father, he will give it you in my name. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be made full. Here he gives us the power of attorney to go to the Father and make our requests. When you pray in that name, it is as though Jesus prayed. There can be no denial. You remember Jesus said at the tomb of Lazarus, I thank thee, Father, that thou dost always hear me. That is the ground for your assurance. John 14, 13, and 14. He gives us the use of the name. And whatsoever ye shall ask or demand in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, that will I do. 
This is not prayer. This is described in Acts 3, 6, where Peter and John heal a man at the beautiful gate by saying, In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. It is as Paul used it in Acts 16, 18, where he spoke to the demon and the girl and said, In the name of Jesus, come out of her. Or, as the name was used on the day of Pentecost, when they baptized those people in the name of Jesus. When we pray, we say, Our Father, in Jesus' name. That is our approach. That gives us the assurance of a hearing. Jesus said, recorded in John 14, 17, speaking of the Holy Spirit, He is with you, but He shall be in you. Reality of indwelling. On the day of Pentecost, we see four things take place in that upper room. Suddenly there came from heaven the sound of a rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled all the room where they were sitting. The disciples were immersed in the Holy Spirit, and when they were immersed, they received eternal life, were made new creations. They were the first people, aside from Jesus, that were ever born again. Jesus, you know, is the firstborn, Colossians 1.8 and Revelation 1.5. The second thing that happened, tongues of fire sat upon the brow of each one, indicating the method of propagating the gospel of the grace of God. It is going to be with tongues of fire. For example, Stephen's tongue couldn't be withstood, so they had to kill him to get rid of his tongue of fire. And the third thing, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. He couldn't come in until they were recreated. And the fourth, they all spake with other tongues. But note that the great thing was that they had not only received eternal life, but they had the one who had raised Jesus from the dead now living in them. We have made a great deal of receiving the Holy Spirit. It has been majored, and we have ignored the fact of His being in us. 1 John 4.4 4, Ye are of God, my little children, and have overcome them, because greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Philippians 2.13 For it is God who is at work within you, willing and working his own good pleasure. Not only are we born again, have become the very sons and daughters of God, but he comes and makes his home in us. Reality of Righteousness The ministry has kept the church in the bondage of sin consciousness ever since the Reformation. None of us have ever been able to get away from it. Most of our hymns are about sin. Most every sermon is about sin. The church has never known of her absolute freedom from sin consciousness. Hebrews 10, 1 through 14 should be studied very carefully. We haven't space to quote it all. First, it tells how the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin. For if it could, the worshippers, having been once cleansed, would have no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance made of sins year by year. That makes us think of the altar service where we ask the believer to keep coming Sunday after Sunday to be cleansed from sin. The blood of Jesus Christ hasn't meant more to some of us than the blood of bulls and goats meant to the Jews. For it was impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. The eleventh verse, And every priest standeth day by day ministering and offering the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But he, when he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. He dealt with the sin problem for us perfectly when we were recreated and received the nature and life of God. At that time, he not only put our sin away, but he remitted all that we had ever committed. And at the same time, he imparted his own nature, righteousness to us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 him who knew no sin, God made to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. And by the new creation, we have become the righteousness of God. So Romans 3.26 has become a reality, that He, God, might Himself be righteous, and the righteousness of Him who hath faith in Jesus. Marginal. Here God declares that He becomes the righteousness of the man who accepts His Son as a Savior. 1 Corinthians 1.30 declares that Jesus has been made to be our righteousness. God is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. And by the new creation, we have become the righteousness of God in Him. But you ask, what is the righteousness of God? It is the ability to stand in the Father's presence without the sense of guilt, condemnation, or inferiority. It is the ability to stand there as very sons and daughters of God Almighty, so that you can go boldly unto the throne of grace and make your petitions, just as Jesus would if he were here. Some faith facts. Faith in the Father is not built upon the word of man, but upon his own word. Man's testimony to the truth of the word has its place, but it cannot take the place of the word itself. The word is the Father speaking. It is as though the Master were here now in person. That word is taking his place. That word has given us life and made us new creations. That word has sustained us and upheld us. It is the word of faith that proceeds from the very heart of the Father of faith. 
The Word is a part of the Father Himself. I feed on it. I breathe it into my spirit. It is being built into my spirit consciousness. It is absolute integrity. Its life-giving quality has impregnated my very being. Man's word, like grass, withers. God's word, like himself, can never die, can never lose its freshness, its power, its ability to recreate, to strengthen, and give courage. You see, the word in the lips of faith becomes just like the word in Jesus' lips. The word in lips of doubt and fear is a dead thing, but in the lips of faith, it becomes life-giving, dominant. Through it, the sick are healed. Satan's captives are set free. This living word in the lips of faith is God's answer to the heart cry of man. Man's word may fascinate and satisfy reason for a time, but the heart demands the word of God. This word illumined by the Holy Spirit is God's light on life's pathway. The word is a part of himself. You can lean on the word as you would lean on him. You can rest in the word as you would rest in him. You can act on the word as you would act if he had just spoken to you. The word is always now. Our modern psychological religions are children of the senses. They use the Bible and quote from it, but it is only man's literature to them. Their writings can't feed the hungry spirit of man. They simply entertain and thrill the people of the senses. These eternal spirits of ours crave the bread of God. Jesus is the bread of life. They that feed on him have no appetite for the theories of men. Don't waste time with the philosophies of men. There is no life in them. In him is life, and that life is our light. His word alone can answer the heart cry of man. Their words may answer the cry of lost, reason-ruled souls, groping in the sense realm for light, but never the cry of the heart.